Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings. And we are about to begin the 2048 to 2049 offseason. And our Wings are World Series champions for the fourth time in five years. And uh, we did it with arguably the greatest season in baseball history this year, a 127 and 35 record, a ridiculous 784 winning percentage. Uh, you can see we were first in the league offensively, first in the league in terms of our ERA, first in the league in terms of our batting average, and third in all of baseball in home runs, pitching strikeouts, and defensive efficiency. So just an awesome season. Uh, won the division by a record 37 games over the Braves. It was a hard-fought World Series, uh, but we did end up winning Game 7 at home against Toronto to clinch the seventh World Series championship in the history of the Buffalo Wings franchise. And as I noted at the end of the last episode uh, with OOTP 25, scheduled for a release today. Scheduled for a release any time now if everything goes well, although it appears that there may be a little bit of an issue with the approval process over at Steam, but hopefully something will get resolved over the next few hours. If the game does end up coming out today, this was probably the last season that we will fully sim for the Buffalo Wings. It seems like there's not really a better ending than going out on top with an historically awesome season. That said, we're not done with Buffalo Wings content quite yet. We're going to be doing our annual season review today. We'll probably do another episode where even if we do decide to move on to spend more of our time in OOTP 25, we try to uh, go through the first couple weeks of the offseason and make some contract moves and arbitration moves and trades to position this franchise for as much success as possible going forward, even if we aren't going to be the GM. We'll certainly be doing a series recap, checking out on everything we achieved, everything we didn't achieve, and some of the uh, record breakers and record holders for this Buffalo Wings franchise. And then certainly we'll be simming forward at least a couple more seasons to find out if Deshaun Seifu, the new Fordham Flash, ends up being a first ballot Hall of Famer. So we're nearing the end regardless, um, but certainly more Buffalo Wings content to come and do sincerely appreciate all of the loyal viewers of this series over the past almost year. Really appreciate you watching. Really appreciate all the comments and the interaction. Definitely has made it uh, one of the most fun seasons I've ever played in OOTP. So taking a look at our team statistics for the year, ridiculously successful, uh, led the National League and led all of baseball with 900 runs scored. And you can see we were first in every major offensive category except for walks, stolen bases, and base running. And we were third in each of those categories in the National League, so still a very successful offense. Pitching, perhaps even better. First in the National League, first in baseball with a ridiculous 470 runs allowed, bullpen ERA of 227, starters ERA of 284, total ERA of 265. First in every pitching category except for being second in BABIP, second in strikeouts, and a good solid defensive team as well, second in the NL in defensive efficiency, and fifth in zone rating. So not surprisingly for a 127 win team everything went incredibly well on the field uh, we had a winning percentage of over 700 every month of the regular season and the strength of this buffalo franchise over most of the past uh, two plus decades that we've been playing this team in the fictional major leagues has been its pitching staff, and it certainly was again this year. Uh, fortunately, we'll probably have all five starters back next year. 
Nehemiah Vidale, who we picked up as a free agent signing a couple years ago, 20-3 and with a 1.83 ERA, a league-best 0.90 whip, and 8.3 war, which was second-best among National League pitchers. Had a fantastic season for us during the regular season. He was not his sharpest in the playoffs. He was 0-2 with a 4.50 ERA in the playoffs, but he gets a second consecutive World Series ring regardless. Jim Lance, uh, who was our ace until we brought on Vidale, had arguably the best season of his excellent career. 20-2 and two record with a 299 ERA, 137 ERA plus, 66 fit minus. Lance, now 30 years old, is 108 and 47 with a 298 ERA over the course of his career. He's been a member of our last five world champion teams, even though he's only the age of 30. Amazingly, he has still never been named an all star, uh, despite having led the league in whip three times, ERA once, war once, strikeout to walk ratio once. And he is um, cementing himself as an incredible postseason pitcher. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, the one time in the last five seasons that we didn't win the World Series championship, he struggled in the postseason, was 1-3 and three with a 5.79 ERA back in 2046. But these last two seasons in the playoffs, he has been incredible. A 4-0 and record each year, a 163 ERA a year ago, a 159 ERA this year, and 30 strikeouts in 22 and two-thirds innings. So Lance now with a 14-6 and six career record in the playoffs, uh, one of the top playoff performers in certainly Buffalo Wings history and all of baseball history at this point. For those of you who watched our uh, Kansas City Royals playthrough with OOTP 23, he's not quite at a Caleb Lagerwell level in terms of his postseason performance, uh, but still trending to be a great all-time postseason pitcher. Danny Black, the 25-year-old, going to be making big money next year, finally arbitration eligible, going to be making close to $10 million a year. We've already made an offer to him to bring back our number three starter, 19-4 and four with a 270 ERA, led the league in walks per nine innings and strikeout to walk ratio. Interestingly, Black, if he had gotten one more win over the course of this season, would have given us a pitching staff with four 20-game winners, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Only happened two other times in the history of baseball. Joey Bills, who had been a guy who had been struggling to find a roster spot for, he's already almost 27 years old, stepped into the rotation this year for our former ace, Alexis Barajas, who we let leave as a free agent. And all he did was lead the National League with 21 wins, 21-4 and four record, 325 ERA, and a 3.7 war in uh, his first season as a full-time Major League starter. And then our number five starter is Jim Coles, O-Captain, oh, my captain, 15-4 and four with a 3.51 ERA. If you've got a pitcher like Coles as your number five starter, You've got a pretty darn good rotation, and we certainly do. Chris McClintock and Floyd Auclair both had strong years as our closer and stopper, roles that they've been in for several years. We've got team options on both of them. Um, McClintock, we are still deciding what to do. He's 32 years old today, led the league with 49 saves, 2.82 ERA, only a one war on the season, though. 146 ERA plus and 89 FIP minus um, indicate that he's still a pretty effective pitcher, as do his ratings. But he's set to make $13 million next year, um, and our salary situation is getting a little trickier, so that's something for us to evaluate. Floyd Auclair also had a team option for this year, upcoming at $11.5 million, which we've already exercised. Uh, Auclair, a little bit younger, and had just another vintage Floyd Auclair regular season, led the league in holds for a sixth consecutive year, led the league in games pitched for the fifth time in the past six years, 
struck out a silly 205 batters in 139 and two-thirds innings and put up a 1.80 ERA for us while posting a 4.9 war in that high-volume stopper role for us. So Claire will be back next year. Danny Kashuk, um, starting to make some serious money. Um, he's going to be making well over $5 million next year. He's a very good left-handed reliever. Uh, you can see the 228 ERA he had for us this year is the highest ERA he's posted over his three years in Buffalo. So a very good pitcher. Um, we only got 43 and a third innings out of him, and that was a career high for him in Buffalo. I just don't know as good as he is as a left-handed arm given the way we use him and the way we've got such a good starting rotation that pitches a lot of innings and McClintic potentially and Eau Claire certainly in the late innings. Uh, he may end up being someone that we look to trade away. Luis Palencia will be back, a guy who can start or relieve 7-1 and one with a 129 ERA in 62 and two-thirds innings, not making all that much money, good solid right-handed arm. Chad Aguirre, a uh, guy who's came up through our farm system, 1.79 ERA in 45 and a third innings. Uh, like Kashuk, another left-hander that uh, we struggle to get <laughs> enough innings out of given how good he is. But uh, with Aguirre being younger and still making the major league minimum, maybe we let go of Kashuk or trade Kashuk away and try to get Aguirre to pitch more innings for us next year because he's certainly capable of it. Ari Caper is another guy who could start for us, a 26-year-old who's come up through our system. 386 ERA this year over 39 and two-thirds innings. Uh, the big knock on him is he does tend to walk a few batters, walk 19 and 39 and two-thirds innings this year. But he's a guy who... Um, isn't going to be making a ton of money next year, a little over $2 million, uh, who can start or relieve. Likely we'll have him back. Solano Toselli, uh, similar to Kashuk, is a lefty that's done well for us. 259 ERA, 62 and two-thirds innings, so he pitched a bit more this year. But he's going to start making more than the minimum arbitration estimate of about $3 million next year. Aguirre will be back as a lefty in our bullpen, making the minimum. I think between Kashuk and Toselli, realistically, we probably only bring one of them back and just try to ensure that whoever we bring back is in a role where they'll pitch more innings for us next year. And then three guys who could be joining us um, next year, Mike Jaramillo and Chris Warrior, who both split the year between Albany and Buffalo once again. And then Mike George, who we picked up on waivers this year. He was up with us all year. 338 ERA over 34 and two-thirds innings. Uh, the 27-year-old did a nice job for us. Uh, another guy whose control is potentially an issue. And he's also going to be making more than the major league minimum next year. So I don't think it's guaranteed that George will be back with us. So we're going to have some decisions to make in the bullpen mainly to just save a little bit of money on the margins and likely try to backfill with the likes of Jaramillo and Warrior, who will both be pretty cheap. But still, even if we move on from a lefty and maybe one other pitcher, whether it's a McClintick at the high end of the salary scale or George at the low end of the salary scale, uh, expect a very strong pitching staff in Buffalo once again next season. Turning to our lineup and our everyday players, and we're probably going to have some turnover here this offseason as well. Steve Banks has been our starting catcher in the past. This year we moved him into a role where he was our starter against left-handed pitching, uh, which meant that he only had 196 at-bats, hit 245 with 12 doubles and 8 homers, in the opportunities that he did have, drove in 37 runs, 95 WRC plus. He's good defensively. He's finally going to be making more than the major league minimum next year. But there's actually a scenario where he ends up our starter again next year. Uh, so we've already made an offer to him. 
The reason that we've done that is that Bobby Huntington, who we bought in uh, in the big trade last year when we traded away Juan Ramirez, is set to make big money next year, um, close to $11 million. So we've got a big decision to make on him. Uh, the bat was really good this year. Not as much home run power as we hoped, only five homers and 391 ribbies. But he did have 34 doubles, and he drove in 55 runs, hit 269. Also pretty good at drawing walks, so it all added up to a 116 WRC+, plus, a 3.3 war. He's a bit above average as a defensive catcher. And certainly, with you look at what our pitching staff did this year, uh, it's hard to imagine he was holding them back at all with uh, the brilliant performance we got from our pitchers. So it's really just a matter of do we want to spend that much money on hunting tin or do we potentially turn the job back to banks and use the money that we would have spent on hunting tin to uh, fortify the rest of the team and then look to the minor leagues for a potential backup for banks or the trade or free agent market. Jabari Habersham, uh, not quite as good as a year ago when he hit 318 and led the league in at-bats, uh, set a team record for hits and a team record for batting average. Still led the major leagues, or at least the National League in at-bats this year. Still scored 100 runs, still hit over 40 doubles, 47 stolen bases on the year. But his batting average did drop uh, by almost 50 points to 275 and his WRC plus dropped 20 points to 84. He can play first base, and he can also play a more than competent outfield for us. A uh, left-handed hitter who's been our leadoff guy the last couple seasons is very valuable. But his salary's starting to get up there. Um, going to be making over $5 million next year, and we are going to have a corner outfielder first baseman type who's on the roster right now who likely ends up being the odd man out. And Habisham is one of a few players that could end up filling that role. One guy who will be back is Jim Reichert. All he has done in his uh, short major league career here, 28 years old, is lead the National League in ribbies three straight years. Nice bounce back year for him this year. Increased the batting average almost 40 points to 277. 40 homers, 135 ribbies, 136 WRC plus when all was said and done. The only knock on Riker is that uh, thus far in the postseason, he hasn't uh, been very good. Only 28. And with the way the Buffalo Wings are playing, uh, he should have many more opportunities in the postseason in the years to come. But in over 2,200 major league at-bats, he's put up a 139 WRC plus in the regular season. When we go to the postseason, he has a 74 career WRC plus in 279 at-bats over these past five years. And he's hit under 200 with WRC pluses of under 70 in the last three postseasons. So he definitely uh, seems to shrink when the stage is the highest and the lights are the brightest. Maybe we'll call him the Kirk Cousins of the Buffalo Wings. One guy who has definitely been clutch is Ramiro Medina. We signed him to an extension this past offseason to play second base, and he responded with an excellent season. He's a guy who's above average at pretty much everything. Hit 281 this year, 28 doubles, 22 homers, 29 stolen bases, 133 WRC+, plus, a 6.6 .6 war guy who's been a member of our last four world championship teams since we traded with the Pirates to bring him on board a little over six years ago. And he has done an excellent job for us. He'll be back at second base next year. Danny Ferguson will likely be back at third base to hit 251 this year. The home runs dipped to only six. Uh, kind of a bit similar to what we saw 
honestly, with Huntington, our catcher, though. The home runs took a big dive, but he had a lot of doubles, 31 doubles this year. Walked a lot, um, so still put up a 105 WRC plus and a 3.1 war. The best thing we can say about Ferguson, he's reliable. He's not all that expensive, and given some of the salary issues we have, um, a guy who's a competent offensive player and a competent defensive player at third base who does it in a cost-effective fashion for us uh, certainly has a spot on our roster next season. Josh Fuchs missed most of the year with an Achilles injury, but he was effective the last month plus of the season when he came back. Hit 312 in 112 at bats, eight doubles, one homer, 16 ribbies, put up a 127 WRC plus in a war of almost one in that limited playing time. Don't think at the age of 26 that he's really going to develop. Um, the home run power, the eye, and the avoid strikeout improvements that our scout thinks are still out there for him. You would think that by this age it would mostly be baked. But he's signed for the next several years to a reasonable contract. He's very good defensively, good in the clubhouse with that spark plug personality. And if he hits anywhere close to the way he hit this past year, he's still a potentially valuable player for us. Juan Palomo was the starting shortstop most of the year while Fuchs was injured, and he hit 290 in 442 at-bats, 109 WRC plus, 2.6 war. He's not as good defensively as Fuchs. He's fragile in terms of his injury proneness, but a good, solid, proven major league bat at this point. 294 batting average over almost 1,000 career at-bats now. And he's hit between 290 and 300 every year, so very consistent. WRC Plus is between 109 and 116 each year, and this was the year that we really challenged him, uh, playing him a lot more against right-handed pitching in addition to facing the left-handed pitching that he had more often than not done very well against the first two years of his career. He is set to start making some money. Um, close to $4 million is his arbitration estimate for next year. So getting a bit rich for a guy who likely is a utility infielder, but think when all is said and done, he'll probably be back with us. Jim Weisenbach uh, was a utility infielder this year. A great glove, uh, but no bat. Hit a buck 71 in 123 at-bats. Did have five homers, six doubles, and 17 ribbies, um, so at least a little bit of extra base pop there with 11 extra base hits among the 21 hits he had on the year. But still ultimately just put up a 55 WRC+. plus. He still was above a replacement level player given his excellent defense across the infield. He's still making the major league minimum next year, uh, but he is a guy who's out of option years. He could possibly be our sixth infielder again next year but it's also possible he gets caught up in a numbers game and speaking of the numbers game i mentioned that we could have some decisions to make in the outfield we probably will have a decision to make in the outfield habisham is one of the guys who uh could be in jeopardy and the reason why is that 24 year old david sandoval a uh, left-handed hitter does still have an option year left but he hit 373 in 51 major league at bats after hitting 316 with 41 homers and 102 ribbies at AAA Albany. You look at his ratings against right handed pitching, and he should be in the middle of a major league lineup 120 to 130 days a year when we're facing a right handed starter. So I think we need to find a way to get Sandoval, who's making the major league minimum onto the 26-man roster as an outfielder next year. And that means that some of the more expensive guys, um, potentially including Habisham, could find themselves moving on. Daniel Aguayo Leal is maybe also in jeopardy, although he's still making the major league minimum. So I tend to think I'd probably keep him over Habersham. He improved a lot this year, hit 281 with 18 homers and 260 at-bats a crazy 158 WRC+. plus. He's a switch hitter, uh, but he's 
significantly more effective against left-handed pitchers, um, better contact, gap power, power against lefty pitchers. So he's been more of a platoon guy for us. Um, certainly could see a situation where Aguayo Leal and Sandoval end up in a platoon together, Sandoval playing more often, and then that gives us a and they would likely be in left field or DH, and that would give us a um, big-time bat off the bench with one of those two guys being saved for pinch-hitting situations every day. Um, so that's certainly one conceivable path to follow. Um, not necessarily the path we will follow, though. Arturo Casares uh, led the National League with 44 homers, also drove in 109 runs. Hit just 260, um, so that dipped 34 points from a year ago. Stole 22 bases, scored 98 runs, 126 WRC plus 5.5 war. He has been a very consistent presence in the middle of our order since he came to the majors for good three years ago. He will be back. And it's possible he could be playing center fielder for us uh, next year, finally, which I know some of you have been uh, touting for a while at this point. Jeff House was our Rule 5 acquisition, missed most of the year with an injury, was one for nine with a double when he did finally come up in September. Um, he unfortunately um, still has 56 Rule 5 active days left because he was injured for such a chunk of the season. So uh, we're going to have to have him on the 26th man if we want to keep him next year. That um, is another why, a reason why maybe we move on from an outfielder, uh, but it also means we might just need to move on from house. Ishmael Velasco um, was the NLDS MVP this year. He was also an NLDS MVP six years ago. And he's a three-time World Series MVP at the age of 31, coming off of a vintage Ishmael Velasco season this year, hit 300, led the National League with 116 runs, 41 doubles, 19 homers, 89 ribbies, 25 steals, 130 WRC plus, and a 5.5 war. The fans love him. I love this personality trait here. Whatever it is, he has it. And you can certainly see that by the number of uh, postseason MVP awards that he's won. He's been a member of our last five world championship teams. He's durable. But we do have a team option for him at $16 million next year. I would hate to move on from him because he's such a good player. But we do have Casares who could take over center field. And as I mentioned, with the likes of Aguayo Leal, House, Sandoval, Jabari Habersham, and Juan Toledo, who we haven't even talked about yet. Um, if we decide that we don't want to move on from Aguayo Leal and that we don't want to move on from Habersham, particularly if we decide that we want to bring Bobby Huntington back for his potentially large arbitration number, there's an argument to be made that we're deep enough in the outfield that um, we maybe look to trade Velasco and his team option for $16 million to somebody else. Don't know that that's the path that will go down, but I think realistically it's one that we need to consider. Juan Toledo, lefty, international free agent signing. Um, big year, 296 average, 36 homers. 100 ribbies for us, a crazy 168 WRC plus with an OPS of over one. Just an outstanding season for the young slugger. Fragile in terms of his injury proneness, uh, but a competent defensive outfielder who's been our right fielder more often than not recently. So you can see we've got, if we include House, we've got seven kind of outfielders because Habesham's really more of an outfielder than a first baseman. Um, so it seems like we've probably got to move on from one of these players, um, possibly two. We're not moving on from Casares. We're not moving on from Toledo, so that's two starters. We're not moving on from Sandoval, 
Um, so that's one of the kind of likely backup outfielder spots. So it's really just a matter between Velasco, House, Aguayo Leal, and Habersham. Do we bring back two of those three two of those four guys or three of those four guys? I think it's unlikely though that we can bring back four out of four of them. So some interesting decisions to make and part of the reason um, I'm thinking about some of the guys making bigger salaries is that uh, our payroll is set to be 40 million ish higher next year than it was this past season. And you can see it's going to go up about another 40 million the year after that with some of these arbitration eligible players. You know, Danny Black's salary is likely to double from next year to the year after. Bobby Huntington, if he sticks with us, a similar situation. Now we do have team options next year, most notably on Nehemiah Vidale, who's going to be turning 38 in that 2050 season. We could clear a ton of money if we dropped that team option for $36 million in the final year of his four-year deal. And then even if we bring Velasco back, got a team option on him, we'll have a team option on Auclair next year. So there are certainly levers for either me or our AIGM to press over the next few years. Um, we can see Juan Toledo expected to make 12, 20, and 25 million once he's finally arbitration eligible. So the salary situation is getting um, a little more challenging, which is the main reason why I'm thinking about what to do with these team options on Velasco and McClintic. And I'm thinking long and hard about some of these um, arbitration numbers as well with Huntington, Kashuk, Habersham. We're going to bring Danny Black back. Palomo still kind of a decision. Toselli a decision. We can certainly get this um, payroll situation in a much better spot for 2049 and buy some of the moves that we would make. That'll be taking money off the books for 2050 as well. And we can afford to bring everyone back next year if we cut our scouting and player development for sli to slightly below the baseline. Um, I don't think I'll ultimately do that. I think ultimately I'll make some of the difficult decisions that need to be made. But um, there's definitely a little bit of work to be made to kind of get the uh, salary structure a little more under control for next year. So some tough decisions, but that's why I get paid the big bucks. And before we finish up the season recap, we're going to check in on uh, one of our former stars as well as our minor league system, Alexis Barajas. Uh, he had been our ace for many years. He had dropped down to being our fourth starter a year ago, and then he actually didn't even make our postseason roster last year. We declined his team option, and he became a free agent, and the now 40-year-old Looks like he may be on his way to becoming a OOTP nomad, a guy who's had a borderline Hall of Fame career, uh, spent the entire season in AAA with the Gwinnett Stripers, 560 ERA in AAA, below average in terms of his ERA plus and his fit minus, and he still hasn't retired, so he's still looking to keep his career going. Um, so I think it's conceivable he ends up playing in the minors again next year. He had a uh, brilliant major league career, particularly with us. 249 and 128 overall record and 207 and 95 with a 329 ERA for Buffalo. Uh, he was a perennial all-star with us. Won a Cy Young Award 12 years ago. And... Uh, he was on our first six World Series championship teams, the only of the seven World Series championship teams he wasn't on was the one that we just completed. So uh, Barajas, for those of you who are wondering, um, still knocking around, looking for a job. Uh, player development, uh, farm system improved a bit over the course of the year, helped by our big investment in player development. Um, believe we were ranked in the low twenties at the beginning of the season. We're 15th overall right now, three top 100 prospects, all pitchers, 
not surprising to those of you who have watched me draft over the years. Caleb Kreveling, who was a first-round pick four years ago, made some really big progress finally this year, listed as the number 40 prospect in baseball, uh, started the year in AA where he was 10-0 and 0 with a 346 ERA, moved him up to AAA Albany where he went 10-2 and 2 with a 4.41 ERA, uh, so there's our fourth 20-game winner. Kreveling was a combined 20-2 and two between AA and AAA this year. Uh, still a little bit of seasoning, perhaps, that needs to take place. We think his control can get a little better. Uh, we think his curve and his changeup and his splitter can all get a little better. But he is uh, close to being major league ready and would certainly think that even if he doesn't start the season with us in Buffalo next year, he'll be up in September at the latest. Caleb Leamy, the number 45 prospect in baseball, was a first-round pick the next year. Uh, made it up to Class A Marathon this year, 7-4 and four with a 456 ERA. Struck out 149 batters in 104 and two-thirds innings, which is outstanding. Uh, but he walked 59, uh, which is not outstanding. Control and whether he's able to kind of harness his mid to high 90s fastball is the big issue that uh, Leamy will be working on. If uh, I had Leamy in OOTP 25, I would certainly be sending him to the development lab in the off season to work on that control. And the final top 100 prospect we have is the pitcher that we picked in the first round this last year. Ben, hate the Drake, Drake, number 56 overall. Unfortunately, his... Uh, First professional season was cut very short by injuries. Pitched just four games, going 0-1 with a 6.06 ERA. Did strike out 23 in 16 and a third innings. Uh, don't think it's going to be a long-term injury. It was a um, mild hamstring strain, and then it was an oblique strain in mid-July that really took him out for the rest of the rookie league season. So hopefully we'll be seeing more of him next year. Still have high expectations for the Drake. A uh, few other guys to highlight in the top 200. Dan Glazuski picked in the third round in 2044. 287, 28 homers and 92 ribbies in high A ball. Um, doesn't look like a superstar, but looks like a guy who could be a pretty useful left-handed hitting fourth outfielder for us down the line in the not-too-too-distant future. Ezekiel Salazar, international free agent signing from 2042. Getting close, 265 average with 31 homers and 88 ribbies for AA Utica. Pretty versatile defensive player, not necessarily an exceptional defensive player but think he's going to have a plus bat and a lot of positional versatility, which will be interesting. And then Jesus Heredia picked him in the first round with one of our supplemental picks a year ago. Uh, he's 20 years old, and he spent the full year in A-ball, and he represented himself well there, hitting 290, 18 homers, 62 ribbies, 121 WRC+. plus. Certainly think with his speed and that contact and gap power and ability to void strikeouts, he could be a very versatile utility guy for us in the years to come as well. Ron Sedano, another guy we'll talk about, the potential two-way player, picked him in the first round with our first pick in 2047. Two and six with a 543 ERA this year in rookie ball, which was sadly a pretty significant improvement from how he performed the year before. Uh, batting wise, hit just a buck 91 and 47 at bat. So still has potential to be a two way player, uh, but still in the early stages of his development, unfortunately. And a couple of guys who are a little closer, Jeff Aguiar, um, not a guy who's come up through our system. We picked him up in a trade uh, a year ago with Baltimore, split the year between AA Utica and AAA Albany, and was outstanding at both levels. Uh, looks like another guy who could help backfill some of the losses that we might take for salary reasons out of our existing bullpen. And then Jenko Harris, a fourth round pick from 2043, split the year between AA Utica and AAA Albany. 
combined for 46 homers at the two levels while hitting well over 300 at both levels. Kind of a corner infielder, um, and really I think in a perfect world, he's probably more of a guy who could give the likes of Reichert and Ferguson some days off and be a pretty interesting pinch hitter off of our bench. But at 23 years old, uh, certainly would expect to see him in the majors in the next few seasons. So we're feeling pretty good about where the Buffalo Wings are and where we may ultimately be leaving them to move out of the GM role into more of a team president type of position. The cupboard is not bare in the minors. And we've got a team that's won four out of the last five World Series that could, if we decide to cut down on our investments in scouting and player development, basically bring back everyone from this team next year. I don't think we'll actually do that. I think we're going to try to clean up some of the salary issues a little bit and continue to invest in our farm system and scouting. But I think that the team we will be bringing back next year should also be very competitive. So we will find out uh, some of those initial decisions that we make in the early stages of this offseason in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching, and hope you have a great day.